Amen. Thank you. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 14. God's work must be done God's way if we want God's blessing. Amen? We cannot decide we want to do it and say we're going to do something for God and then say, God, I want you to come bless my effort of doing something for you. We're going to see in chapter 15 next week something that I have said to you before and will continue to say is that the Lord is with you when you are with him. You say, well, God just promised to always be with us. No, he promised to be with you when you are with him. In the, in the work that we do, in the way that we live, in the, the things that we do. We're with him, then he's with us. If you want to be with God, then find out where he's at and go get by him. When I was a little kid, the one thing I loved to do, especially when I go to revival meetings with my father, is when the revival meeting was over, or, or actually when the invitation was ending and, and he turned it back over to the pastor and he sat on the front row, I would sneak up there beside him and sit by him. I was always proud of my father to watch him preach revival meetings, and I loved being near him. And so at the end of the service, while the preacher, the pastor, was making final remarks and announcements or whatever, I would, no matter where I was, I would slip up beside him and sit next to him. And I was with him. I found him. I went looking for him. God has promised to be with us when we're with him. God's work must be done God's way. We began this morning in chapter 14 talking about Asa and seeking God in war. Seeking God in war and how Asa, number one, he was prepared in case. As I mentioned to you, he had 10 years of peace. And in those 10 years, he did not waste his time. He did not sit back and enjoy the, the peaceful days of the kingdom. He prepared because Asa seemed to know that at any moment, at any time, the enemy could creep around the corner and attack. It is well, it does well for us to remember tonight that just because you're enjoying a time of peace from satanic or demonic attack on your life, do not sit back and think that all is well and it can never happen again. At any moment, the devil can find your weak spot because he know, he seems to know where it's at and attack you with all the fury of hell itself. And you find yourself in war and in conflict. Some of us have experienced moments where life is going great. Everything's, as a matter of fact, if I'm having one of those times, I start getting scared. If everything seems to be going well and I, everything's good, I'm thinking, Lord, what have I done? Because it's always that calm. In, in Louisiana, when we were expecting the, the hurricane, the tro by the time it got to us, the tropical storm, to come through, it seemed to always get real still. The day that Katrina hit New, or New Orleans, in Alexandria, Louisiana, it was just a nice, peaceful day. And the wind, occasionally we'd have a gust of wind come through and relieve the summer heat. When things are all going well, you better check up. Uh, my hero, Brother Manley Beasley, who taught so much on faith and lived a life of faith that I, I find just almost incomprehensible. But he said, you're either in a storm, you're just coming out of a storm, or you're headed for a storm. That's encouraging, isn't it? <laughs> That'll bless you right there. <laughs> but you know what? Some of you have lived life longer than I have, and you know that to be true. God uses the storms of life to teach you how to trust him, how to walk with him, how to depend upon him. And we're going to see that in the life of Asa tonight. So number one, he prepared just in case. He built up the walls. He built up the defenses of the cities. He created the army, as we talked about this morning, the offense and the defense, and how they're both necessary to win the battle. But I also want you to see that it wasn't just his, an intuition. God had him do that on purpose because it came about. 2 Chronicles chapter 14 and verse 9. Zerah the Cushite, or King James calls him the Ethiopian, marched out against them with a vast army and 300 chariots and came out as far as Mereshah. Asa went out to meet him and they took up battle positions in the valley of Sephatha. Near Marishah. Now, in the King James there, it says that 
uh, Zira, the Ethiopian, marched out with a thousand thousands. In, in other translations, that, that term has been translated a million, that he marched out with a million, a million man army. Uh, really, the NIV has it the closest to the translation because the language there is not intended on giving you exact numbers. It, the language there is to see, show you that he was overwhelmed. The odds that Asa faced as the commander in chief of the army were overwhelming odds. Even if it were a million men, let's say it were precisely a million men, he had 580,000 at his disposal. So he was at least outnumbered twice, by, by twice, at least. The, the NIV translates that a vast army, a vast army, that, that he was way outnumbered. Now, I like what he said there. Asa prepared just in case, but I also want you to see he presented himself in courage. He prepared himself just in case. He presented himself in courage. Look there in verse 9. It says that Asa, I mean verse 10, Asa went out to meet him. And they took up battle positions. Now, Asa knew he was outnumbered. All he had to do was climb the nearest hill and see that the Cushites or the Ethiopians were everywhere. They were all over the place. And he was outnumbered. But the Bible says he went up and took positions against him. Even in the face of certain defeat, being outnumbered and overwhelmed, encouraged, he took himself and took up battle positions to face them. It should be a lesson to us tonight that, that we may be going along and life is just fine and suddenly everything, we are overwhelmed. You ever been there? It seems like everything that could go wrong did go wrong. No matter what you're facing, what you're experiencing, uh, everything was good and all of a sudden one phone call. And you're down and out. You're overwhelmed. The odds are against you. Nothing looks good. But I want you to see that it didn't stop him. He didn't back away. He didn't run. He didn't flee. That's what we want to do. We want to hide. I want to run it. I'm telling you, if I'm outnumbered two to one, something tells me to get out of town. <laughs> but Asa didn't. He didn't. He presented himself in courage. He, he drew up the battle lines and he faced them head on. I'm going to tell you something, church. You can face your problems now. Or they can come back bigger and you're going to face them anyway. In her book, Carol Cimbala, she wrote a book called Faithful. And she said in her early days of ministry and working with the choir at Brooklyn Tabernacle, <clears throat> that when, when a problem would arise, her nature was to put it aside and come back and hope it goes away. See, that I can relate to that because that's generally how I used to want to deal with problems when I was early in the ministry. I, didn't, I don't like confrontation. <clears throat> and so my hope was when, when somebody would get upset about something or there would be an issue arise or a problem, I, my, my thought was it will go away. Ignore it long enough and it will go away. It never did. And what she said in her book is what she found out was that every time she ignored a problem, when it came back, it was bigger. It was always bigger. And a lot more to deal with than if you just handled it the first time. And this ought to tell us something. Asa went out and faced him. They was overwhelming odds. They were difficult situation. They were outnumbered. But he went and stood his ground and faced him. And I would say to you tonight, church, no matter what the odds no matter how it looks like in your life, go ahead and face it. Go ahead and stand up. Present yourself in courage and say, I'm going to make it. It's going to be all right. Courageously, he stood before two to one odds. So, number one, he prepared himself just in case. He presented himself in courage. But he prayed also in faith. In the next verse, if you'll look in verse 11, he did what he knew to do. I want you to notice that. He did what he knew to do. During the, during the peaceful times, he built the army. He, he built up the defenses. He did everything he knew to do. He took himself to the battlefield. He didn't run from the fight. He didn't run from the problem. He faced it. But then look what he did. He prayed in faith. And Asa called to the Lord his God and said, 
Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rely on you. And in your name we have come against this vast army. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. Now, in the King James there, it, it lends the, the idea where he says, um, you're, you're not a favor to the mighty or the weak. It gives the idea that God doesn't favor one. He can help either one. He can help the mighty to win. He can help the weak to win. And that's the truth as well. Because I'm going to tell you, just because you think you're mighty don't mean you're going to win. But what it says here in the NIV, and I like that translation as well, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. I don't know why, but I have found it to be true every time that God responds to desperation. God responds to desperation. When I have come to him and say, God, I have exhausted all other resources. I have done everything I know to do. I have acted every way I know how to act. And God, if you don't do it, it won't be done. If you don't come through, I'm just relying on you. I don't know what else to do. And I think God is in his own way saying, that's what I'm waiting on. That's what I'm waiting on. Get to the end of yourself. Do everything you know how to do. And then trust me. Rely on me. Take me at my word. And trust me. God responds to the desperate cries of desperate people. And God occasionally, well... God most often takes us through difficult circumstances to bring us to the end of ourselves so we'll get desperate for him and quit trying to do it ourselves. Quit trying to fix it ourselves. Get desperate for God and say, Lord, I'm going to rely on you. I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to trust you. Because you are God. That's what he said there when Asa cried out to God. Oh, Lord, our God, we rely on you. In your name, we have come against this vast army. Oh, Lord, you are our God. You are our God. We're not trusting in something else. I'm not trusting in me. I'm not trusting in you. I'm not trusting in what this world can do. Our reliance and dependence and confidence has to be in a holy God. Our desperateness, our desperation has to be for God. We can trust in a whole lot of stuff. But if you want help, it comes from your trust in God and rest in him. Asa called to the Lord. He did all he knew to do. And then he said, God, you're going to have to do what I cannot do. My mom used to tell me all my life, son, God will not do what you must do. But you cannot do what only God can do. And it's been a reminder to me through the years that uh, I, I prepare, I study, I, I read the Bible, I prepare my, I pray, I seek the Lord. I do everything I know to do to when I stand before you, I, I'm not just empty. But what I know is all of my preparation, all of my reading don't mean a thing if a holy God doesn't start speaking through me. I do all I know to do, but at some point God has to do what only he can do. The problem is we don't get, fall back enough to let God do what he needs to do. We keep trying to do it ourselves, make things happen ourselves. Asa reached a point where he said, God, there's nothing I can do. I've put together an army. I've built up the defenses, but this army is greater than anything I've got. They're bigger than anything that I can do. You're going to have to do something. We rely on you. He prayed in faith. He prepared just in case. He presented himself in courage and he prayed in faith. Lord, we do. We, can only, we can't do that. You're going to have to do this. We rely on you. I like that. Lord, there, there's no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. You know, I can only imagine in the theater of my imagination that Asa up until this point, might have thought he had a good army. 580,000 men, that's good. That's a big army. They've been trained. We had the offense. We had the defense. Everything's ready. We're, we're good to go. Until the Cushites showed up. And they had twice, at least twice the number of men he had. Suddenly, everything he thought he had going good for him was not enough. 
And everything we try to do in the flesh, what we will find out every time is it's not enough. It's not enough. What God is waiting for you and I to do is to say, Lord, I've done all I know to do. You're going to have to take me and and whatever I am and work through me and do something way beyond what I'm capable of. Because in my flesh, I read it this morning in my devotion, in my flesh dwells no good thing. But my dependence, my reliance is on you. We're going to see over in chapter Uh, 17, when Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, uh, came against the same type of situation. And and in his prayer to God, he said, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. He said, we rely on you, and in your name, in your name, it's a spiritual battle. In your name, God, this this uh, uh, this is to show people who you are. This isn't about us as Israelites. This isn't about us as First Baptist Church. We want a world to see what God can do. The miracles of a holy God. The power of God. He said, in your name we come against this enemy. Do not let man prevail against you. You see what he, his prayer said. People who are coming against us, they're not fighting us. They're fighting God. Amen. He said, people come, our enemies aren't fighting us, they're fighting God. Lord, don't let man prevail against you. Oh, he was desperate. So he prepared just in case. He presented himself in courage. He prayed in faith. And then I want you to see number four, he prevailed in battle. And then look at, look at verse 12. The Lord Struck down the Cushites. Did it say Asa? Did it say the the men with the big shield and the spears or the bow and arrow? No, it said the Lord struck down the Cushites. God responds to desperation, church. When when God's people come before him and say, Lord, we've done all we know to do, you're going to have to handle this. He said the Lord struck down the Cushites before Asa. And Judah, right before their very eyes, he said, the Lord struck them down. The Cushites fled, and Asa and his army pursued them as far as Gerar. Such a great number of the Cushites fell that they could not recover. They were crushed before the Lord and his forces. The men of Judah carried off a large amount of plunder. The Lord struck down the Cushites. If we could remember that church, that the Lord fights the battles for us. We may come against tough enemies. We may face the devil in in ways that we didn't know were possible. But the Lord fights the battles. He won the victory already. Satan is a defeated enemy. Amen? He's already been defeated. All he can do now is cause you fear. And the way he does that is he throws things your way you were not expecting. He puts situations and circumstances in your life that overwhelm you and confuse you and surprise you. And the first thing we do is sit back and go, oh God, what did I do to deserve all of this? But why don't you quit feeling sorry for yourself and trust a holy God to take care of you? And cry out to him in desperation and say, Lord, I don't know what else to do. I'm just depending upon you. And the Lord struck down the Cushites. He fought the battle for them. Matter of fact, it says that, and then the army began to pursue them. They didn't just stand still. When God gave the orders, they took off and pursued them as far as Gerar. And do you know that history tells us that it was almost 200 years before they had trouble with these people again? Amen. Well, that ought to encourage you tonight. God thoroughly won the battle, and it was almost 200 years before this, this country attacked them again. And then, so, so I want you to see. He was prepared just in case. He presented himself in courage. He prayed in faith. He prevailed in battle. And the last thing is, he profited in plunder. 
Notice what the Bible says. The men of Judah carried off a large amount of plunder. They destroyed all the villages around Gerar, for the terror of the Lord had fallen upon them. They plundered all these villages. Verse 15, they also attacked the camps of the herdsmen and carried off droves of sheep and goats and camels. Then they returned to, they went home then, they returned to Jerusalem. They brought home more than what they brought with them. God so miraculously won the battle, they took away with, they came home with more than what they left with. How many people do you know went to war and came home with more than what they left with? No, when we think of war, we think of losing. Losing lives of loved ones. We don't think of gaining. But boy, when the Lord fought the battle, they came home with more. And we're going to see in chapter 15 that they used what they brought home and sacrificed it to God. Offered it back up to him. And it all goes back to when they were in times of peace, they prepared themselves. When they faced situations they didn't know and didn't understand, they were courageous. When they'd done all they knew to do, you know what's the Bible say in Ephesians 6? When you've done all to stand, stand. When you've done all you know to do, stand. Don't move. And when they'd done all they knew to do, they called out to a holy God and said, Lord, we've done all we know. We've done everything we can do. We rely on you. Church, there are some things that we have to do. But then we need to understand tonight, there is a point that God has to do what only God can do. And we have to trust him and rely on him and rest in him to do what only he can do. And then they won the battle. God routed the enemy. They won the battle and came home with more than what they left with. What an awesome God we serve. If there's anything that ought to encourage us tonight to get our face pointed toward heaven and cry out to a holy God in desperation, Lord, we don't know what to do. We rely on you. And watch God win the battle. Watch God do what only he can do. What can I do? I can seek God. I can be obedient to the Lord and by faith believe that what he said he would do, he will do. Amen? Oh, glory to God, church. We're going to see God do what only he can do if we'll turn our face toward him. Amen. I tell you what, let's stand. Come on, brother, hurry, hurry. I want us to sing victory in Jesus. Amen? Because that's what we have. To, if we have victory tonight, it's in Jesus. It's not in you. It's not in me. It's in him. So let's close tonight. We're going to go out singing. Victory in Jesus. All right.